Hey folks, welcome back to the show. My guest today is Katrine Volinsky. Katrine is a functional nutrition consultant and she is a survivor of Chernobyl. So she shares with us her journey of healing from radiation poisoning and all of the many twists and turns that that took. One of them involved actually collaborating in the development of masszymes, the digestive enzymes marketed by bioptimizers today and they played a crucial role in her healing but we talk about much much more than that we talk about where raw veganism fit in for her by the way she's no longer a raw vegan um, but there was a time and a place when that was part of her journey as well as fasting um, Katrine is a wealth of information she's also been trained by Craig Conover in NAD therapies and to that end she runs monthly NAD retreats out of Sedona, um, which, I mean, sell out pretty fast. But uh, if you jump on it, if you're down for five days of deep, deep, deep detox and healing, then this might be a good stop for you. So if you're looking to connect with Katrine, it's Katrine Volinsky on Instagram is the best way to reach, reach out to her. And um, if you have any questions, comments, anything about the episode, you know, you can always reach out to me, natnidham.com. And um, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for being here. Oh, and one last thing I'm going to say is that this is a very long episode. So pace yourself. You may need to chop it up into bits or at least a couple of parts um, because we went for quite a long time. Katrine is not only easy to talk to, but such an interesting person that it's hard to know when to stop. Anyway, enjoy the episode. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Welcome to the podcast, Katrine Volinsky. It is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> it has actually. I mean, I mean, what? I think when did we first? I guess we met at the Upgrade Labs conference last September. Is that mm -hmm. where we first yeah. met? I knew in about person. You. In person, in person, we spoke so many times on the, uh, all the different rooms in the clubhouse before that. Right, right. Uh, that was the first in person. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And then, uh, and then Dasha, our mutual friend, mm -hmm. is really the one that made the real, real life connection. Oh yeah, because that's mm -hmm. one She's of her many like talents <laughs> for sure. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so today, I'm I'm actually really excited about this conversation because you know it's. Um, I'm just really stoked to see where it's all going to take us. But I think that where we're going to start is I was going to start with your obsession with eating at 430 in the afternoon, but <laughs> <laughs> which I discovered at the last conference we were at together, where I found myself leaving wherever I was, whatever I was doing at four o'clock going, gotta go. I'm having dinner. And people were looking at me going, you're doing what? And I mean, I like to eat dinner early, but you right. take it to a whole new level. So we can maybe talk about that later, but I think what the best place to start and where I start with all of my guests is really about your story. And you do have a fascinating story, which is, I would guess at the root of why you do what you do. And a lot of the things that you've sure. contributed to. So I'm going to shut up and let her rip. go. <laughs> well, I think a lot of us come into this business because we've had something that pushed us to search more and deeper and find people and mentors and therapies and ways to get out of whatever situation we were in and help. Unless you were born into a family that has these values that basically has health on the forefront, which is hopefully my family is like that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, usually you'll get to these things later in your, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, when you really get faced with major issues and you have to change your lifestyle. I was lucky enough to get faced with a lot of you know, health issues much earlier in life. And I say lucky because it basically turned my whole life upside down. I wouldn't have wished for anything else. Definitely would have changed like a minute in my life because it's always led me to more discoveries, more incredible people, more happiness, more just pure purpose in life uh, that I didn't have probably if I wouldn't have had these experiences uh, with mm -hmm. health issues. So um, my journey to health started when I was young. Um, my grandparents were in the energy, uh, energy industry. My grandfather was a nuclear physicist and he was traveling and working in, in a variety of different capacities in the Soviet Union, working on nuclear submarines, working in the nuclear icebreakers and nuclear 
plants. <laughs> so that takes us to Chernobyl because that was one of the places he worked on and I grew up with my grandparents. And I was there during the uh, situation that happened in 1986. And uh, the, um, after the fallout, uh, we also lived in the area that was getting about 40% of uh, um, nuclear fallout as well. So my whole life been basically kind of tinted by the radioactive exposure. Mm -hmm. And of course, that first blast of radiation had a huge effect on my family and myself as well. My parents, uh, my grandparents, uh, other uh, members of my family all had cancer. They were able to survive and uh, thrive actually afterwards as well, which I always say it's probably because we have some pretty crazy mitochondria now that I understand <laughs> this. <laughs> I mean, they were survivors in general, you know, they went through all sorts of, you know, crazy things during the revolution and during Stalin time. And, you know, we're not going to get into that story, but you get the idea, you know, how mm -hmm. those people survive, you know, you have to be really strong to be able yeah. to do that. So uh, post uh, Chernobyl, as a young child, I didn't have too many issues. And I, I've had some bleeding disorders and things like that, but I wasn't as bad as, let's say, my cousin who had leukemia, who mm -hmm. was the same age as I am. And out of a kids of 40 wards, 40 kids in the ward, cancer wards, she and another child survived. That's so it. it. So yeah, two that's kids it. Of 40. Yeah, yeah, wow. exactly. Over time, like it took time and took years. And now, like, you know, to the uh, there, she's the same age as I am. She was just the only two people that we know that survived and thrived and had children. Again, going back to genetics and mitochondria and just, you know, just the interesting things that happened to us in life. And that's a whole other story what happened with her and her parents. But uh, the uh, thing that I think helped me not to get extremely sick early in life is I was uh, somewhat a rebel and I didn't want to eat uh, meat and a lot of dairy. I proclaimed myself a vegetarian much younger in my age. I just had this affinity for animals and I really loved them and I didn't want to eat them. Mm. So I think it's one of the reasons why I didn't get as sick uh, as uh, some of my peers and even my family. Why? Most because when you're consuming uh, products that are animal products, for example, just think about this. In Soviet Union, especially post uh, radioactive, radioactive explosion and the um, uh, nuclear fallout, there was really poor control of food stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So the animals grazing on radioactive you know, grass and things uh, like this will compound radiation. Right. right. The rest right. of the family was heavy, meaning you know, eating uh, heavy meat eaters, and they were consuming way more products, animal products, than I have. So I, that's what I contribute uh, attributed to. But, but who knows? Wouldn't the vegetables grown in the soil also? Yeah, but think about radio, it. You but know, not as much. Not as much, and you, yeah, like just the concentrations are much higher in animal products than Interesting. they are. That's interesting yeah. point. Yeah. So that that's just my idea why that happened. I have like other thoughts about that too. Obviously, that wasn't the time for me to get sick. But later on, when I started getting into my teens and started having hormonal changes, that's when it really kicked in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like as soon as you add that extra layer of information in the body, you know, things can go right really quickly. I started having like hemorrhaging, all sorts of other problems with hormones. Uh, thyroid, of course. And by the time I was 17, I've gone through so many doctors and so many different places where they were poking at me and looking at me. And it was just really, you know, you, you felt like a little rabbit, you know, yeah. in, the, in the test lab. Very so intense. It was really damaging. I, I always say that I always had like a period trauma as well, you know, as a young woman, just constantly being asked and looked at and things like that. And it's, it was a very interesting thing to unwind later on. But basically, mm -hmm. by the time I was 17, I was pretty tired and now uh, of everybody telling me what to do. And, you know, like my parents constantly freaking out because I had such low levels of hemoglobin. I was like literally passing out in places and things like that. And uh, one of the days I basically bled out internally to uh, uh, um, complete, you know, death, not complete death, death, basically. By the time they found me, I was in a pool of blood. I couldn't, yeah, I had absolutely no blood left in me. And by the time they got me into the surgery room, I had a full heart stop and I had a clinical death experience, uh, which wow. is a whole other story of what happened then, you know. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, 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 a little... It was a, it was a pivoting moment because before that, you know, um, given everything, even though like I was, uh, uh, you know, feeling like a rabbit and, you know, in a, in a test lab, 
they were still trying, the doctors, they were still trying to use more natural methods of trying to help me. They did not put me on drugs. They did not put me on hormones. They tried as much as possible to heal me with other modalities and not get me on heavy duty stuff. But at that point, there was no choice. Once yeah. I came back to life, they're like, okay, here's what you're going to get on. And uh, of course, the package was heavy duty as far as pharmaceuticals goes and also hormones, but it stopped the problem. It stopped mm -hmm. the hemorrhaging. I got pretty stable, you know, I was given some other interesting uh, uh, substances like peptides and, uh, and bioregulators to Were you help. at that point? Yeah, at that point, this is, we already, you know, as you know, in Soviet Union and in Russia, this is something that, you know, has oh, been yeah. quite, quite normal, right? They were old news by then. I mean, this is what, yeah. 20 something years ago that, you know, Kevin started working on them, what, 40 years ago. So exactly. They were so 20 years in by then. And a lot of actually victims of radiation and post-Chernobyl were taking bioregulators and peptides and it was something that they were working with to trying to find ways to regenerate the DNA and regenerate some of the organ loss and tissue. So uh, um, at that point, I was kind of, you know, fixed, you know, so I, it was, it, it was great because it allowed me to kind of move forward in life and, you know, put some of the trauma behind me. I moved over to Canada and started my young adult life, which was not entirely healthy because I was doing double major. I was working really hard. I was working at night for, you know, a finance firm and I was flying all over the place, not taking care of myself. Also, there was a huge change in environment and huge change in the foods I was consuming because I grew up on a pretty natural diet, as uh, many of you know, probably like a lot of Eastern European countries have um, families that are really connected to nature, to mm -hmm. like gardening, to like having things that are coming from your own garden, from your own animals, from, you know, gathering things out in the forest, things like that. So that's something I grew up with. And uh, when I moved to uh, uh, Canada, I didn't realize you had to go and shop in the farmer's market. No, you had to go look for organic stores. And I even remember having an experience of, you know, going to just like a normal Safeway and getting food and thinking, oh, wow, well, you know, food very feels different here. It's like plastic, you know, yeah. it's empty. <laughs> well, if you were going to Safeway, it was plastic. <laughs> So where, exactly. where did you? So where in Canada did you go? To Vancouver? Yeah, I lived in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Nice. So it took me a while to figure out, you know, like where to shop and how to do it. But yes, but also just being a young adult, you know how that yeah. is, just pushing your boundaries and, you know, doing things that are not very healthy for you. Plus also just chasing that lifestyle, that lifestyle of abundance and lifestyle of even more than abundance, I would say just, you know, what you get programmed with you know, get the degree, get this, get that, you know, just like go forward in a, in that manner. And nobody's like asking you to grow in the spiritual way. Spiritually, or no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I really was pushing those boundaries and, you know, I did quite well. And by the time I was in my uh, early twenties, 22, 23, that's when my body started giving up because obviously I wasn't fixing the problem that I was just perpetuating it. And it just gave me a little bit of time, all those drugs and hormones that I was on. And at that point, I started, started having everything from chronic fatigue to fibromyalgia to like literally having teeth fall out. That was pretty scary because uh, as maybe some of you know, the uh, some of the radioactive particles, especially strontium, get stored in your bones. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to get them out and detox. So my body was literally rejecting some of the tissues and parts of my body because it was just so radioactive and toxic. Wow. So at that point, I started looking for solutions because I couldn't function, I couldn't work. You know, I was enrolled in master's programs in the financial mathematics, and I just couldn't get, use my brain anymore. Right. So I started going the uh, more um, Western route, going through Mayo clinics, going through uh, as many doctors as I can. Nobody had a solution for me. They were all giving me a very bleak practice. No, says, you know, they're like, well, a couple of years at this point, <laughs> you know? Wow. So wow. Uh, at that point, I was like, well, that's not the message I already heard, been there, done that. <laughs> so I think there's other ways to heal and other ways to, to find yourself. Um, me and Wade Lightheart, who is part of the Bioptimizers crew, uh, were kind of on a similar trajectory at that time. He was my trainer. And through him, I was also exposed to a lot of people that were focusing on their health and, uh, and nutrition. So I decided, I was like, well, let me try that route. It would be a, definitely there is nobody telling me here that it's impossible to heal yourself. And mm -hmm. if anything, everybody was like, no, you can do this. And, you know, if you just write, find the right protocols, right people, like the body is amazing and it can go through a lot of healing processes um, that are told not to be, you know, possible, right? 
So at that point, I sold everything that I had and I was super lucky. I always tell people my um, biggest blessing was the fact that I did have finances. Mm -hmm. I was able to stop everything I was doing and just heal. And the fact that I was in my 20s, I was in my 30s, 40s or 60s when you have less growth factors and hormones and just yeah. the ability to heal. So I did have a couple of things on my side, right? And that mitochondria that we talked about earlier. <laughs> so at that point, I basically put everything in the storage and uh, decided to convert all of my stocks in private placements and to cash and start looking for people and technologies and therapies that could help me heal. And I basically tried everything from, you know, um, a long time ago, NAD therapies were terrible. I did those, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they were in what, horrible. In what way? I had I had no business of doing them. They were like uh, alcohol protocols, you know. They were mostly done in uh, in addiction protocols. That's that, that were right. not healing protocols. That was before two thousand and four, where a lot of these discoveries were made. So majority of them were administered like in Mexico and other countries in Latin America for detox purposes. But I was like, well, detox, you know, you know, if I have radioactive particles, I need to detox. Probably that's going to help, but. I was taking way too big of doses and um, just like bad pH, just horrible experience. Like literally had to be wheeled out on the chair. I was going to say they must have leveled you. I mean, it, it oh, leveled me. Leveled me. Yeah. I mean, and I had a lot of those type of experiences <laughs> just leveling me out. Yeah. It was a lot of times like one step forward, two step back. So maybe five steps back, but you know, like I had to go through all of that because there isn't a manual. Nobody gives you a no. manual. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, there's lots of different solutions and ways. But nobody had a way it's like this is first this is second this is third and there wasn't one cohesive person that was leading my case either you know it's just me going through all these different people all these different technologies different clinics and trying to piece it together and just listening i was like okay well you're saying that's gonna work let me try it you know how when you are desperate that you just mm -hmm. will do that right and uh, um that gave me a lot of personal experience with a lot of interesting protocols. Eventually, I found some things that worked uh, quite well for me. Uh, the turning point happened. And I, a lot of times people say, like, what is it that healed you? Like, what is it that turned turn things out? It's everything. You know, for sure. It's all of it accumulation. Just some things were done out of order or some yeah. things I had no business of doing and they were taken back. Again, nobody gives you a manual for that. But I think all of it led me to a place where healing could take um, place and and could uh, help me get over my conditions and just get my energy back and start healing myself but for me that moment was when I went raw vegan that really raw. yeah weird I know right because <laughs> you're not raw um, vegan now anymore I know because I've eaten with you a lot of times <laughs> yeah I'm not a vegan now I was raw vegan for quite a while and I was vegan for probably what 10 years or so so yeah, uh, before I found out that I was pregnant, <laughs> right? A whole other story, but yes, basically, uh, that uh, that was an approach that actually helped me quite a bit. Uh, the other factor that kind of played into uh, healing was doing highly enzymatic protocols uh, mm -hmm. that we share now via bio optimizers. You know, the guys are sharing it from performance point of view. I was taking them for healing purposes and for healing myself from radiation. And you were you were part of the team that formulated those enzymes, are you? Were you not? Yes. So uh, myself, Matt, and Wade, we were friends way back then. And both Wade and Matt were my trainers at some point. And <laughs> they they were the people I was hanging out the most with. Mostly Wade. Uh, you know, Matt was doing a lot of work for him. You know, by himself. Plus, <clears throat> Wade and I had a lot of parallels in our interests as far as meditation and spiritual work goes, and a lot of other things. We're still best friends. So um, the enzymes came into our lives around the same time when I was healing and, and Wade was going through his process of recovering his body from bodybuilding championships and getting himself in a little bit of a precarious place as well. Yeah. I met the doctor, um, Dr. O'Brien, you probably interviewed Wade before or some of you heard maybe. <laughs> yeah, Wade. I have interviewed Wade and I'm going to interview him again in another month or so. So Right. So that's uh, that's how... We met Dr. Michael O'Brien. He was definitely a huge light in our lives. And he taught us about enzymes. He taught us about probiotics. Um, he encouraged me to fast more as well to rebuild my body. And um, that's something that really did um, change things around. It was like a, that pivotal point where you went from just like one step forward, two steps back to like many steps forward and all of a sudden being able to stay on top of things. So it was uh, 
a lot of, again, vegan food, a lot of fasting and a big enzymatic protocol doing like about 100 to 150 enzymes a day. And we were first taking Michael O'Brien's enzymes. And uh, eventually we got into a place where I was like, well, we need our own stuff. This stuff is very expensive, number one. Yeah. Uh, number two, the boys were, you know, seeing how it would be so beneficial to build muscle, especially on vegan mm-hmm. vegetarian diet. And that's when the idea uh, of bringing that product into already existing market, we had a product called Freaky Big Naturally, where we're teaching people how to build muscle naturally. That was like internet business one-on-one. Freaky <laughs> Big Naturally. Freaky okay. Big Naturally is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. But it worked. Wade was, of course, the, uh, you know, the face. I was the poster the boy. Of yeah. Of course he is. Yeah. Matt was doing all the marketing. It was, it was pretty fun. It was fun to have a community. It was like a first time having a community that was like really interested in natural ways of muscle building and health and things like that. So it was kind of pretty uh, uh, interesting community that was ready to, you know, listen and uh, integrate anything we found useful. And that's how Mastimes were born. That's why they're called Mastimes <laughs> because they were because for mass. Oh, no exactly. Kidding. Yeah, so, exactly. So tell me this. So what is it that you think helped your, because at this point, like you knew that you had strontium trapped in your bones and God knows what else. So radiation was still very much a part of your physiology. Mm -hmm. So what what do you think? So is it the raw vegan plus the fasting and the mass signs that finally allowed your body to kind of expel it? Or was there Um, something else that that you think you did that might've contributed to it? One of those like, like I said, there wasn't there wasn't one it's thing. Cumulative I think all thing. of it, cumulative thing. Uh, I think before I started using enzymes, I was really focusing more on detoxing, detoxing, yeah. detoxing, 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 and not really building, not really building in the body. And when we met Dr. O'Brien, he was like, "Well, you know, all of the enzymatic, all of the antioxidant systems that are basically being damaged by the radiation are enzymatic, and you need more enzymes, and you don't mm-hmm. have any." Right. Mm -hmm. So you need to build a body. Right. And this is how you build the bodies. And that's basically, I think, why that helped, you know, the introduction of enzymes helped me to absorb more food and start being able to rebuild some of the tissues right? Right. that I wasn't able to do before. So I think I did pretty good job cleansing. I just didn't get a good job starting to rebuild the body and being able to um, it, I think it's also helped me normalize some of my liver function and detoxification pathways, plus the fasting, you know, obviously mm-hmm. I was in ketogenic state. And at that point I knew nothing about, you know, ketones or ketogenic space. You know, he didn't tell us anything about ketones, <laughs> you know, he didn't, it wasn't a thing of that. It wasn't a thing. <laughs> it was just, yeah, just fast, you know, but it wasn't just fast. It was, um, I was calling it's like, I was, I was squeezing my fasting muscle for a year. I was preparing for a, for a 40 water day fast where I was fasting once a week, uh, like consistently. Then I was fasting at the end of each month for about three days and quarterly for 10 to 14 days. So it took like a year to get to a place where I was pretty comfortable. And that's when I engaged in a 40 day water fast. And that was like wow. a major shift in my system and healing. And then obviously it got me into deep ketosis and rebuilding. And during that, year of using fasting obviously i was also using ketogenic states i was also using the enzymes and a lot of like high quality plant-based proteins not animal based proteins they just Mm -hmm. the information i had at that time and it worked for me (laughs) listen i you know (laughs) here's the thing about veganism and vegetarianism Mm -hmm. i think that as interventions at certain periods of time in our lives it might be the thing that you need i think where i think where some of us in the space get a little, you know, gnarly about it maybe, or, or are questioning whether it's the best mm-hmm. strategy is when people become emotionally attached to something and, yeah. and believe it's going to be the only way forever. And oh, you're no longer doing what your body needs when mm-hmm. your body needs it. Yeah. And that's when the shift changed, uh, you know, for me is when I became pregnant, which again, wasn't in the cars. It wasn't supposed to be. And, you know, like that was just a, a lot of work wasn't it wasn't my purpose i was just trying to clean myself up after working in fukushima which i actually went to japan and work after fukushima explosion over there i know you did (laughs) why (laughs) yeah good question right i i wanted to know the truth you know i'm just one of those people that just wants to know and especially when it comes to radiation and living through a situation like that i want to know what is actual reality like what what is the situation over there? Like, what are the levels like? And I had a uh, an incredible opportunity to go work as a part of a team and check it out for myself, um, take some samples myself and also work as part of the team. Uh, it was really interesting 
interesting, one of the most interesting times in my life, that's for sure, was uh, far out. But uh, so let me ask you this before you go on. Was it emotional when you went back there? Like, did you feel like, did you have any kind of emotional reaction just going moving no. back into that space or no. you would pretty mm -hmm. much no with that. The, the only time I had an emotional reaction is when that movie came out on HBO <laughs> they, they really got that right and that was definitely giving me like PTSD because like all I remember is like living in the middle of the night and this crazy color and just the fear you know, and my grandmother's like, you could yeah. feel it, right? Well, I remember you telling me this story that your grandfather called your grandmother in the middle of the yeah. night and said, grab the kid and get out. Yeah, and yeah, she yeah. was like, no, I'm not leaving without you. And he's like, right. oh, but you are. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So yeah, we were, again, there's a, a lot of interesting things about that. I think it's just the PTSD and just those hooks in it. But I didn't have that when I was there because um, it was just different, right? Like you, yeah. you don't get triggered in the same way. Um, I came with a clear mind and I came out of my own volition, right? I had protocols that I felt were really um, great for yeah. being able to deal with it. I also had a stinky suspicion it wasn't like it was in Chernobyl, um, just based on the information that I did have, but I wanted to know more. And that's why I went and did that little stent, stent over there and learned a lot in the process you know the differences kind of gave me a lot of kind of alleviation of um anxiety about the world and what it would be like for the oceans and you know like how much how much uh, of this pollution is coming in uh, also saw how well some of the things were managed in japan and how things were not managed well it was mm -hmm. again like it was all over the place so it was, it was an interesting thing but that's that's something that when I get, got back, I still knew that I needed to get my body cleaned up and, you know, like did a whole year of uh, detox practices. That's when I got into nutrigenomics because that was like about 2012, where a lot of information with Amy Yasko and Stuart Kendall and all the MTHFR people were coming out. So I really started integrating the Lynch, all of that information mm -hmm. and learning more about methylation pathways, more, more, learning more things about, um, toxin accumulation and bioregulation and things like this and uh, biotransformation. And during the process of this year long cleanse, I did such a good job <laughs> on my hormones that I found myself pregnant. <laughs> ah, well, well, I know, right? <laughs> Even with like organs missing and, you know, like hormones not being there and everybody always like, yeah, I don't know. I, you would have to like, you know, work really hard to get anything and still have a huge um, potential and risk of having, you know, some complications yeah yeah, yeah. The hospital for and sure things like that which you know definitely not the case in here and we're blessed with a very unique human being that you know came into our life as our son but uh what happened what going back to the diet that was the first time i was vegan for quite a while and uh that was the first time that i turned to animal foods as i was about probably five six weeks pregnant i didn't know at that time i was running a juice bar at one of the festivals, like raw food and juice bar and friends next door had a, uh, a breakfast all day uh, kind of set up with like eggs and things like this. And before we started the event, they like brought out this huge pan of eggs, you know, just to feed us. And I'm like, I must eat this right now. Oh <laughs> my know? God. That's it, was, it, was, it was it was like the most bizarre experience. I've never had, the, I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to eat this. And I felt so good. Felt so good. And I was like, and I kept, I was like, okay, this is very interesting. Like I will just roll with it. Obviously my body needs it and I don't feel bad after and everything feels great. And I actually have more energy. And then like a week later, I was like, oh, okay, well, that totally makes sense, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> but but yeah, that was uh, like pure just listening to your body and not having any type Interesting. of you know, guilt or anything like this and being long time vegan and respecting animals. It was like, no, my body needs this. Like this, this is important to listen. And to me, a lot of times that's how I see animal products anyway, it's medicine, the same yeah. as plant medicine, plant, uh, plant plants, you know, vegetarians, and that's all medicine. And mm -hmm. if you respect, your body and your food you know like and find those situations where you know your um your makeup physiological makeup and your um health condition align with what you're eating and you're addressing your other problems that can arise with like emotionally eating and um you know aspects of psychological aspects you can really find something that works with you and moves with you as you're yeah. changing and you know as especially as a woman 
right? We have so many stages, you know, in exactly. our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Never stops, really. <laughs> it never stops. Yeah, it's, it's not a 24 hour cycle like it is for men. And it's not like more or less the same. We, we go through a lot of shifts and, you know, a lot of them on a weekly basis, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important to listen to this and get more education about that and not be shamed, you know, when you do need animal protein. Like, I think it's just so sad when I see that. And at the same time, I also have a lot of um, sadness around how animals are being raised and absolutely and all of that. That's like that's a whole other subject, right? Well, and you know, you live by you live by your truth, right? Like, I mean, having having spent a few days with you and getting told at four o'clock in the afternoon we're going for dinner, but every night was a new experience because you had ferreted out the next amazing farm to table <laughs> restaurant you had a, I don't know if you called the chef or what and you knew where they were getting their meat and where the vegetables were coming from like you definitely live by those principles um, sure. even when you're traveling which is mm -hmm. which is amazing because usually a lot quite often people are traveling and they're like oh you know what I'm traveling it's fine you know when when you travel that's when you really have to be on point especially Absolutely. when you travel a lot and yeah. you know, on the road a lot that's where you know like you said things go out of the window and that's when I'm the tightest with my mm -hmm. diet that I'm the tightest with my sleeping schedule with my fasting you know routines and things like that making sure that I bring my products with me that helps me stay on point and not to deviate especially when you're like on the road every weekend because you have a show every weekend yeah and you're on the plane and you and do a like lot this. of that yeah, yeah and, that, and that's when you have to be really strongly um settled into your routine and yeah. really say no and research things ahead of time and it's fun it's a fun project you know oh I'm yeah coming to a new town and going like okay where is the farmer's market like <laughs> even if i'm not gonna buy anything i'm gonna go to the farmer's market because i want to know Oh no, I get a I got a message from her, you guys. I'm in I'm at this conference. I get a message from her at 11:30 in the morning on a Sunday going, "Oh my god, I just had the best brisket of my life." <laughs> I'm at, I'm like, "Where are you?" And she's like, "I'm at a farmers market." I'm like, "Holy jumping. You weren't kidding." Like <laughs> We were yeah, at a Burning Man party the night before, and there you are at the farmer's market the next morning, just like you said you would be. <laughs> yep, yep, that's that's like that, <laughs> for sure. I mean, we vote with our dollars, you know. And, and Yeah, uh, yeah, I know, I believe that. Uh, absolutely. So supporting your local farmers, supporting your local CSA, really understanding where your meat is coming from. If you yeah. are consuming animal products, you have to know where it's coming from. You have I agree. To call them, you have to find out. You, know, you have to find somebody nearby. What, what are they being fed? Is it grass finished? Is it you know grass fed? Where is the uh, fish coming from? Like I researched everything, you know, and I usually yeah. um, do the same for my clients and find ways to optimize their diets the same way as well. Because uh, you know that's your own responsibility. Yeah. You know, no, and it's a, it's important. You know, I think that um, I think to your point, like eating animal products is it's a responsibility. Right. It and it's, exactly. and if we take it seriously, I think we and the world become a better place because what we don't want to be doing is supporting factory farming, both for moral and ethical and health reasons. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, when I talk to a farmer or whoever, where I'm buying my meat, I was actually just had this conversation last Saturday with a butcher. And I said, you know, cause he's trying to pitch me on these, on, on some meat. And I said, well, did it have a good life? And he mm -hmm. kind of looked at me and I'm like, dude, you know, the story, I want to know that the animal had a great life until it had a bad day. And at the end of the day, we all are going to have a bad, that bad day. It's mm -hmm. going to happen. But mm -hmm. you know, if that animal was treated with respect and raised properly and fed properly all the way along, I do think that there's it becomes part of a natural cycle. And if we don't over, and the other thing is consumption, right? Like, are you going to sit there and eat a 16 ounce steak every night? Or are you going to eat an appropriate portion of meat? Like Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what I'm talking, talking about emotional issues and psychological issues that are connected to food, right? Yeah. And respecting, respecting the body, respecting the animal, respecting the environment, and just not gorging ourselves. We live in a society of more. Yes, you know, more, more, more of everything. Right. And that's how we got ourselves into this problem of having serious mitochondrial issues and dysfunction, overfeeding our mitochondria, feeding in the wrong foods and not exercising, not moving, being away from sunlight and, and the actual earth. Yeah. Right? And then we wonder why we have such crazy rates of chronic illnesses and cancers and other issues that's just skyrocketed in the last you know, 30, 40 years. 
That's why. Mm -hmm. we, we don't pay attention and we don't educate our kids. Like yeah. I always say it's like when, when we go to school, nobody teaches you how to take care of your body. Nobody teaches you how to take care of your environment, your finances or your relationships. I mean, like, it's interesting, you know, like you don't learn those things that are so important. You well, know, they're foundational. For, I mean, frankly, exactly. you could learn everything you need to learn in school through the lenses of taking care of your body, taking care of your finances, learning, you know, like Absolutely. you could, you, you could learn math, you could learn everything through those lenses if that was the direction they took. Um, I have a question for you. When you were doing all that fasting, there's a lot of talk right now in the women's yeah. biohacking community about timing of fasting for women through their cycles. Mm -hmm. Did you pay attention to that much or did you just, like, I'm actually curious about that. Like, or did yeah, you I mean, it's, it's have a, it's a schedule? A good, yeah, it's totally good conversation. That was not an information that was available at that time. That was not a conversation. Nobody was talking about it. There wasn't also no. clubhouses and, you know, Instagram no, no. and things like yeah. that. And as you know, in the research uh, on women's health, we've, we've always been like basically thrown out of the sample size, yes. right? <laughs> right. If Far too unpredictable, woman, exactly. way too many variables. We're exactly. not dealing with this. Yeah. So that was not available. That was not part of my story. There wasn't a lot of education around it and hormones and, and cycle in general. Like that's not something that I've even learned. I must say I didn't also focus on that. I focused on a completely different set of issues, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was fasting, I was not thinking about my cycle at all. Plus I've had so many issues in that department. In as that well. department, exactly. So that, that I couldn't, I couldn't really go by it, especially going raw vegan and fasting. I didn't even have a cycle sometimes for like a year or two. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was just like, that's what happens. But nobody told me that's the wrong thing actually in like in raw food. Uh, uh, community that was celebrating. I was like, oh, you're not producing toxins. And I was like, well, now I know that you just don't have hormones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. But let me ask but you it, another another question. Right. Did you did you stop taking the bioregulators when you left Russia? Like did that I kind did. of stay behind there? Yeah, yeah, I did. I completely stayed behind. I honestly went completely into uh, and totally into just taking the pharmaceutical again, young adult, not thinking, thinking everything was fine. Plus, you know, all of a sudden, all the issues that I've had for years just went away. You right. Know? So it's like, oh my God, I can live my life. So I didn't really think through it. Nobody taught me to think through it. Right. 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 And nobody said you really should be on this X, Y, Z. And I didn't even think about that. I was just, I just took the drugs to yeah. performance. Right. Yeah. And that's why I never healed. Right. That's mm -hmm. why nothing ever happened. It's just like, I did that plus increased lifestyle stressors, everything from food to stress, still not sleeping into just being young and stupid, <laughs> you know, not stupid, but yeah, just it's part of the human experience. Yeah. It's part of the human experience. Yeah, of of the human experience. experience. You know, chasing yeah. the success and chasing things, it can get you in, into trouble. So going back to fasting conversation that didn't really start hitting me until my thirties. So I've gotten into like a pretty good rhythm with fasting. Um, and once I kind of corrected a lot of other hormonal issues and started actually getting normal cycles and, um, you know, had the birth of a child and that actually shifted a lot of things as well. One of my mentors said, it's really good for women to get pregnant and have birth, <laughs> you know, we are meant to do that. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So, and I did experience that that actually helped with a lot of things afterwards and normalized a lot of things. Interesting. But it also, of course, made me way more sensitive to fluctuations in hormones and just being in 30s and having different hormonal profile and being a young mother and you know not sleeping and all of those things that come with having an infant and things like this. That's when I started paying attention more to the cycle and I started paying attention more to when I'm fasting naturally before this conversation started happening in a, a more of a like, you know, nutritional space, um, yeah. which was only been going on for the last few years. You know, so. Oh yeah. It's very recent. Very yeah. recent. So about like 10 years ago, you know, that's when it started kind of coming up natural for me. I just noticed just some things, some days I was like, if I fasted on the wrong time, like I'll lose the cycle. Right. So I started paying attention to those things right. just naturally. And of course, after the birth of the child and experiencing completely new body that's when i started becoming a little bit again more in tune with these things and um at that point i also knew more stuff uh, um knew more stuff as well i've gotten deeper into my understanding of physiology biochemistry uh instead of being just like okay like uh, who has answers i'm gonna do that and i don't you know i don't know why but i'm gonna do it <laughs> you know and then i'm gonna see how it's gonna work out and start thinking like well why did it work and why 
that didn't work. And putting things together and starting just working in the space, working with people, working with mentors, you know, working in clinic space, clinical space. And it, it just comes naturally that you expand your knowledge base. Mm -hmm. and learn more things and as i was expanding my knowledge base and learning more about like functional diagnostics and you know epigenetics and things like that uh i became more in tune too with what was going on in my body and i started putting things together plus you know helping women through their issues as well you know you start working with people one-on-one -on -one, you start seeing things and patterns especially when you're working very deeply with somebody um instead of having uh, somebody just come see you randomly whenever they're sick, working on a coaching basis, you yeah. can get to know somebody much better. And you get a lot of feedback, um, like all of my people from the beginning had to write down everything they were eating, they were feeling, all the environment. I was like, the intakes were insane and they didn't like it, but that was the only way for me to figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I started putting patterns together and things together I was like oh okay i mean i can see this and that and then another thing that happened was cgms came out yeah cgms came yes. out uh before cgm it came out in the space of um consumer based right it came out by um, prescription but in canada it was available for free it still is yeah. yeah yeah but without prescription right uh yeah so, you can go to costco yeah. and get your and by the way guys for those of you listening who don't know what a cgm is that's a continuous glucose monitor so it's this funky little disc that has a little tiny mm -hmm. little needle in the middle. You stick it on the back of your arm and it feeds back information to now your smartphone at the time. I don't know how it was doing it about your blood sugar at any given moment in the day, really. Yeah. And we didn't have a smart form before. And like there was a little scanner that you was. Oh, scanning. right. There was so, that little right. scanner thing. Yeah. 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 So you didn't, you didn't have a fun little programs that would go with it and nutritionists explaining the data. But when it came out, it was like, well, wait a second. This is like an amazing behavioral tool. Number one, number two, it's giving me a lot of information about my cycle. Of course, uh, experimenting with it myself and then putting things two and two together and just watching clients go through their cycle and seeing fluctuations in glucose, starting to understand insulin resistance and sensitivity in different parts of the cycle, starting put, putting things together. That's just what yeah. you do, right? I was just lucky enough to jump on that wagon pretty quickly as soon as mm -hmm. they kind of came out just because of, you know, the Canada being available, right? And I just saw it as being a very interesting tool to be able to uh, get more responsibility out of my clients and behavioral change. And that's when you had to figure out what it all means. Right? Yeah, because you didn't yeah. have nobody was telling you. Yeah. Nobody was there. So there was a lot of research, a lot of working in PubMed, you know, trying to find other people who are actually using this, you know, like trying to find doctors that are understanding this aspect of hormones, which is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, to find somebody who understands this more now. I'm so grateful that it's just becoming such a better tool. You know, after COVID happened and the, all of the uh, um, connections between your glycated proteins and, you know, basically your glucose levels and your um, pre-diabetic condition, diabetic conditions and connections to COVID, it kind of gave like a big push uh, mm -hmm. to take care of your blood sugar, right? Yeah. It was there before, but I think it's really put a lens on it. And I think a lot more practitioners and doctors and a lot more offices are looking into this and using it and it's just becoming such much widespread information and with time it will be less and less expensive i just spent some time with somebody who is making a new generation cgm that will only go one millimeter in skin oh and really yeah and the the costs are going to be way less once they put it out and the app looks amazing so it's coming uh, to, to be more affordable of course it's a little expensive now but it's still such a useful tool. I think um, if you're not too anxious <laughs> looking at your uh, blood sugar levels, that's another thing. Don't attach yourself to the numbers. Don't attach oh, yourself yeah. to anything. You know, don't create more anxiety for yourself. It's just numbers. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, for sure. For sure. Yes. And, and I mean, we see it all the time, right? With people yeah. who track their sleep and become obsessed sleep, with the numbers and glucose. feel judged in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, even the same thing with glucose, like cloaking your carbs and all of that, you're still eating way more stuff. <laughs> I mean, like yeah, exactly. don't things and things yeah. like just because your glucose spike is not happening and you're like in this nice little range, it doesn't mean you didn't overconsume your calories. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you didn't deal with your emotional eating or like didn't, it doesn't mean that you found the right nutritional pattern for you. Yeah. It's a useful tool in a context. And mm -hmm. I think it's really good for behavioral changes and also figuring out like some little particulars to yourself, right? 
and uh, especially as women, you know, like we have mm -hmm. different needs and different uh, insulin sensitivity during our cycle. So it was very useful. So yeah, like using the CGM way back, that's when I actually started watching things go awry, you know, when I was fasting in the wrong times of a cycle. I was like, well, wait a second, my glucose should be going down and it's going up. <laughs> and I was like, interesting. And it, was like, it wasn't, it wasn't computing a second. I was like, oh, wait a second, my body's stressed. That's why my glucose is up, right? And yeah. of course then ketone meters started coming out, a lot more information on ketogenic space started coming out. So I started using both of them together to, you know, see when I should stop fasting. And then just naturally, you know, over time, building informational base and learning more about hormones, learning more about fluctuations, learning more what it's like to be a woman in your 30s or 40s, right? And now going through perimenopause, which is a very different animal than when you're in your 20s. Mm -hmm. So and how, how much uh, more sensitive you are to things. So you really have to watch out for this thing. So I think when you're younger, you can get away sometimes with stuff. But again, it just depends on the person too, and your, um, you know, just how much reserves you have and your hormonal health and things like that. But for sure, in 30s and 40s, you really have to pay attention when you're cutting your calories because uh, anytime you're cutting your calories as a woman, your body is trying to figure out, well, is this famine? You know, are we not going to be able to have a baby? <laughs> you know, like, are we not going to be able to have offspring? Yeah. So it will shut down some of the hormonal protection, right? To be able to deal with those environmental factors which is what the signaling is about because you know this has been thousands and thousands of years of evolution where the body was taking environmental cues to figure out well is it time to reproduce right mm -hmm. and this is our biological you know number one business is to reproduce you know no matter as, what and yeah as far <laughs> right? as my mother nature is concerned that's job one that's for sure exactly. i mean it's job number one so the body is always looking at checks and balances whether okay this is a good time or not right so when we are fasting in the wrong periods of time, especially in like later in 30s and 40s, where there is just less hormones to start with anyway, right? Yeah. So you can get into trouble quicker, right? So you have to pay attention to that. And I definitely do. And I see huge benefit, you know, like using cycle awareness and uh, um, supplements and training and, you know, diet that is connected to the cycle. And that's when some of these tools like, you know, the CGMs and the uh, sleep tracking devices that also have the temperature can be very useful. You start seeing patterns, but right? you can, you can preempt certain things and help yourself to feel better during times when you might be just low or not schedule or reschedule yourselves on the, on the weeks where, you know, you know, yeah. that might be a little bit more problematic. So, so actually, so for the audience here, why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, when, when you think, when is the best time for women to be fasting? And when you're doing a long fast, what is that sign? What's the sign you're looking for that says it's time to stop? Like, let go of the ego. I know you said you were doing 10 days. It's mm. been seven and a half. It's time to let it go. Bef yeah. I think the context matters. Yeah. Right. Like, are you, what are you fasting for? Sure. I think that's the number one question we have to always ask ourselves. A lot of times women are fast for really wrong reasons. Yeah. They want to lose weight. Yeah. And I've done that. So yeah. like my story was 40 day water fast. The first one was great. I've learned some things. I was like, okay, I'm going to go for the second. I still have things to learn here. I optimized things that I saw really needed to optimization. Added a few things, subtracted a few things. Second one was great. Third one was total ego trip. I had really? no business of fasting. I crashed my thyroid so hard. It took me two years to get it back. <laughs> you really? know, like, yeah, really? absolutely. So, so, so that's 40 a days, like that's, that's I mean, long. that is mentally tough, right? Because mm -hmm. what I think people struggle with the most is, you know, it would be, I mean, it would be hard enough to fast for 40 days, period. But right. to fast for 40 days and still exist in a society where so much revolves around food, mm -hmm. the resilient, the mental toughness it would take to do that <laughs> would be pretty epic. Yeah. Well, again, I was in a different space. You know, I was healing. It's not like I had to uh, maintain a social life and it's not like I had to go to work again. Everything is context, right? Yeah. So if I was in a context where I didn't have to do any of this, I didn't have to show up for all. I just have to show up for myself and keep with my goals and, you know, stay away from you know, things that I knew would just take my energy. And then, like you said, the first, the first fast, you know, for me was I was in a, in a city. And I really, that was really too much um, nervous system input. 
So mm-hmm. there's a lot about nervous system as well. We haven't gotten into that at all, but it was the nervous system was jacked just from traffic and people and EMFs yeah. and things like that. It was not the right environment, you know, and I definitely felt it. Like I was almost psychically too wound up. It was just, just felt everything. Everybody was driving me nuts and things like that. So the second fast, I definitely was uh, remote, you know, it was warm. Um, it was different conditions and it was quiet. It was a lot of internal uh, work and spiritual work and reading and meditation, things like this. Again, I didn't have to show up for the world, right? I was in different place. Yeah, well, that's um, that. It was showing up for deal. myself. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, I've done five day fasts when I was working hard and it's brutal. You shouldn't do that. It's yeah, brutal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's fasting really hard. is a time of rest. Time is uh, fasting is a time of rest and restoration. You shouldn't be overloading yourself, right? Yeah. So when is it? So first question: Why are you fasting? Right? What's mm-hmm. the reason? Um, second is like, what is an appropriate amount of fasting for me? Right? Again, if it's a woman who's really overweight, you know, and let's say postmenopausal, you can get away with more fasting because again, there's not that fluctuations and things yeah. like that. Uh, and especially when you have a lot of weight to lose. And even in those um, in those conditions, usually there is insulin resistance. I get my clients to get cleaned up first, make sure that their mm-hmm. biotransformation transformation pathways are working, the elimination pathways are working. I would never just just put somebody into fast. But you I can't, remember, I mean, they can't do it, right? They I can't mean, but... do it, even 24 hours. I remember the first time I fasted, yeah. I'll tell you. So the first time I fasted, I was taking awful herbs and I had splitting headache. I was just, just horrible time. And I was watching the movie, about the pianist, pianist, remember the pianist? That movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like three hour movie about Holocaust. So I was like, I have, I shouldn't have watched that either. Bad yeah. time to watch the type of stuff. But yeah, it was, it was a horrible experience. Nowadays, I understand a lot about opening up the uh, biotransformation pathways, elimination pathways, getting to place, uh, getting to a place where it's easy. Right. Mm-hmm. And the people don't have that experience. The majority of my clients, when they get to that place where I was like, okay, now you're ready to fast. Yeah. I'm starting to expand 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours. Right. But it's getting, figuring out some of those dynamics for them first to make it easier. Can you do it without a Sure. I did it. You know, it's just more painful. And sometimes it's, it's, it's hard, hard to start with. What do you, when you say the biotransformation pathways, what are you talking about? The pathways of elimination, we got those. Like that's bowel, yeah, urine, biotransformation like the liver. Is- yeah, well, that's 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 the biotransformation pathways, right? Uh, it's detoxification pathways. That's okay. your inflammation cycle. That's your you know phase two. Because a lot of times, yeah, detox. A lot of times before you know, like I I found out information about uh, epigenetics and before 2012, there was a lot of cleanses from like healing holistic space that were really pushing phase one detoxification, yeah. which is in your liver. You have phase one, phase two, and there is in your gut phase three. So a lot of the classic herbs, like, you know, the mixicil and this really pushing the phase one. But if you are like, just pushing oh, yeah. out, the drainage is not open. How I explain to my clients is like phase one, there is a garbage truck. I mean, not the garbage, there's a whole bunch of garbage. Their body puts it on little bags, you know, ties it all up and puts it on the side of the road. Phase two, the garbage trucks come over, pick it up and take it out. Right. If the phase one is putting out a lot of garbage, but nobody's coming to pick it up, you're going to have a lot of freaking stink in there. Well, right. and it's going to rot. Like, and that's rot, the thing. Phase exactly. one often moves yeah. it into something that's more toxic to begin Absolutely. with if you're not that's moving it out. Exactly. So, yeah. so really making sure those, those methylation path, those pathways are open, supported, and working properly. Right. And that's where diagnostic tools can come in really useful. Uh, or just, you know, working with the person and, uh, you know, working through, a, you know, a, a, like kind of logic tree. A lot of times I don't even need that much testing anymore to see, to help them find, yeah. you know, like the right things. You, you know how it is. It's just the yeah. majority of things are pretty straightforward. But so you definitely start with the lifestyle things. And you do that before you get into yes. a strong fasting routines. If you're doing intermediate fasting, that's a very easy way to get into it without a big, you know, like investment of your time and energy into figuring out your, um, you know, th- those pathways, by transformation pathways, elimination pathways. But as far as, uh, you know, going into longer fast, it's like, first of all, what is the reason, right? Um, what, how old is the person? Right? Mm-hmm. What is the, yeah, the end goal, the reason, right? And definitely watching the phase. If it's somebody that is postmenopausal or not perimenopausal or like over 35, you know, that's when you start seeing those things. I am definitely more likely to 
recommend longer fasts if that's necessary or if it's part of the healing journey or looks like a good fit for that person early in the cycle. Mm-hmm. So maybe like several days after the cycle, uh, your ends or even like at the end of your cycle, just depends on how much bleeding they're experiencing and right. just how much blood loss hemorrhaging. So usually like front loading before the ovulation, you know, yeah. having more times to do that. Leaving ovulation alone, I definitely don't like to fast an ovulation. You need glucose during that. You might have a small, tiny window right after like the ovulation and, you know, like in the last yeah, but uh, afterwards, but it, it's hard to catch sometimes. So you have to be mm-hmm. very in tune, you know, uh, and that's when shorter fast will work better, 24 hours to 36 hours. Um, of course, there's different variety of fasts. There's water fasting that we talked about. There's uh, um, things like prolon, which is I'm not a big fan of, but I think it's a, a good way for some people to like enter into it, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I like to reproduce prolon with real food. I don't, that's, that's I don't like I the prolon do. kit. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I don't I, like the, we're on the same page there. It's I, space I, food. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I yeah. got it and I was like, ugh, I can't do this. This is like dead to me. But a very easy way to do it if you wanted to keep your um, uh, proteins under a certain number is to just consume, if, and if you don't have problems with coconut, just consuming like coconut powder, like layered a couple times a day, you know, so you have the fats and MCT oils uh, that um, there's a new product called Keto Brains. I like that one. So it kind of supports mental function and gives Keto you Keto Brain. Energy. Okay. Keto brains. Oh my God. So tasty. Is it <laughs> really? Have, like lion's mane and alpha CPG in it. It's, it's great product. Oh, and I have to powder. look that up. Oh yeah. You're going to love it. You know, <laughs> that was our new collagenius from, uh, from, uh, uh from bioptimizers. Oh, yeah. That stuff is amazing together. Um, yeah. Talking about something that brought my HRV up <laughs> tons and tons of mushrooms. So um, going back to uh, the, uh, yeah, you could do those, those fasts, I think sometimes might be a little bit easier than going into just straight up water fast. Um, the other one that I really like to use personally is um, if I'm doing like fast mimicking diet is um, consuming a bunch of chlorella tablets or spirulina tablets. Hmm. First of all, it's detoxifying. Second, it gives me something to chew on. You know, yeah. because a lot of times I just want to, you know, chew something, right? Maybe supplement with a little bit more seaweed, like seaweed packs or dolls, because you've got the minerals, you've got the salt, you have the iodine. It's kind of very supportive to the adrenals to have that when you're going through a fast. And of course, with chlorine and spironina, you've got the chlorophyll, you've got the, you know. Oh, yeah. Huge detoxification there. As a matter of fact, when I used to. Mitochondria. Yeah, when I used to put my clients um, through the five day FMD with food, I would have them make wraps with big sheets of nori. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, nori. I, I, I do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one quick, easy uh, snacks if like I'm out of. Um, and it's salty, time. crunchy, savory. It's got all the, it hits it's all, got the all the things. It hits all the marks <laughs> and it's good for your thyroid. <laughs> right. Right. Lots of iodine. Like I consume so many seaweeds. Yeah. And I'm really big fan of spirulina specifically for mitochondrial regeneration. The only thing you have to like really find the raw spirulina. I don't know if you've had Catherine from Energy Bits uh, on your podcast or you've seen her around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's been on a lot of uh, in the space. You know, she really focuses on raw spirulina in her mm-hmm. tablets. And because anytime you hit the spirulina, you'll lose some of the uh, dismutase out of it. So it doesn't have the same mitochondrial effect. So I definitely look for either raw spirulina that is uh, like kind of like uh, liquid form. You can get that as well out of Florida. I can send you a link. You can add that to the show. Yeah. Or you can get it in tablets. I like it in tablets because it's crunchy. Something to <laughs> so. eat. Well, and chlorella is interesting also. Um, I don't know if you know primidine, the, the spermidine supplement, mm-hmm. but their new gluten-free one is a particular strain of chlorella from, yeah, chlorella from and Japan. Is incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, this chlorella has, and spirulina has been researched a lot in Soviet Russia for, as a space food. Yeah. Right? Well, cause they're so nutrient dense. Yeah. And it helps you protect uh, from radiation because a lot exactly. of radiation out and it prevents some of the DNA damage, it prevents some of the mitochondrial damage, right? It's something that was used post Chernobyl with kids, you know, I've had it, um, more spirulina than chlorella, but chlorella as well. Um, there was a very interesting study that was done in the uh, Soviet Union, and they had a very specific way of growing chlorella in these tanks where it was like super nutrient dense and it only comes in liquid form. It's probably one of, was one of the most potent things I've ever tried in my life. 
really oh really, yeah it really gave you a huge boost like i don't know maybe one day it will make it out here and it's like it's a very specific way of growing it because it's a lot about grow like how how it's grown especially when it comes to spirulina and uh um all the other algae a lot of it is is grown in not really great conditions and oh yeah no for sure i know with um oxford oxford health span they were very conscious about where they sourced Absolutely. Their you have to be extremely uh, conscious. You have to test. You need to know how it's produced. So definitely look for those companies. Don't just go for something cheap. Uh, you're not going to get results, number one. Number two, you can get actually contaminants mm -hmm. in them as well. And it so, actually is worse mm -hmm. because it almost like tricks the body. I'm, you know what? I'm just looking at this up. Um, oh, my gosh. Yes, I accepted the cookies. What? <laughs> yeah, it is chlorella. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. the primidine is chlorella, but it's a very specific strain. But you know, what's interesting because you said it protects uh, DNA. Mm -hmm. So this chlorella is very, very high in spermidine. And of course, spermidine also protects DNA. Protect DNA. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting synergy between those two. Yeah, I'm always looking ways how to speak to mitochondria, right? And how to regenerate mitochondria, because at the end of the day, that's disease of our, you know, life right Same yeah our children you know like our popul our generation and furthermore you know like that's 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 getting passed on from mother to her child and to mm -hmm. the next offspring so it's really important to get on top of that and finding ways to regenerate mitochondria regenerate um, um ways to detox and protect it and get rid of dysfunction which is um one of the reasons why i love eating chocolate <laughs> Oh my God, you and your chocolate. Okay, you guys, listen to me. If you ever happen to spot this woman, and for those of you watching this on YouTube, you now know what Katrine looks like. Um, if you spot her, throw yourself at her feet and beg her for chocolate because this woman is behind the best chocolate I've ever, wow. ever had. <laughs> Literally, she walks around conferences with these, these bags and then there's like these, shiny wrap thing it's it's hilarious because by hilarious. like a day into the conference people have figured it out and she's surrounded by people begging for chocolate well you know and it's not just any chocolate let's oh just, no you know, like, <laughs> talk about that you know why the reason why i like chocolate for mitochondria besides the fact that there is polyphenols you probably all heard about that is it has steric acid right and it's one of those things that can actually been shown in studies to increase uh fusion mitofusion Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a very unique fat and chocolate cacao butter specifically is really high in it. So that's my reason to eat it, <laughs> besides the fact that it tastes amazing. But, you know, the caveat for that is just to make sure that your source is extremely yeah. clean. Um, and a majority of chocolate in the market is coming from you know, big companies, especially that do not source really well. They're not mm -hmm. been to bar. They don't. Um, Think about environmental factors, as we said about animal products, it's the same as cacao, right? It's yeah. a very unique uh, plant and it also been abused quite a bit. And uh, you have to know where it's coming from. Like, I have to know where it's coming from. I need to like been to bars, like my type of thing, understanding where it's coming from, what soil it was grown and does it have heavy metals? Of course, as a person who's had to detox from a lot of different things. And yeah, you're not I'm not going back there again. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I actually, uh, the, one of the ways I started paying attention to levels of heavy metals in my cacao and my cacao paste and cacao beans was... I started seeing like my cadmium and lead going up. I was like, well, wait a second. I'm not taking anything. I I'm, I'm should be not seeing this. And I was like, oh, it's chocolate. I'm eating a lot of raw, um, especially like Ecuadorian chocolate, which is naturally the soil is really high in cadmium. And the cacao plant has an affinity for it. So it will uptake it if it's in the soil. So sometimes it's not to do anything with agriculture, although agricultural issues are also there. Um, as well as, as environmental and sustainability and the way the tribes are treated that have the land and have the plant or the strain. So that's one aspect of it. But second aspect for me was to start testing for metals and start mm -hmm. looking for cacao uh, paste and pods and um, ways to access things that were clean. Of course, some um, some origins are just naturally lighter in some of these things, like Dominican, let's say, or, you know, some of the Colombian can be actually high in cadmium, just depending how high in the, in the mountains it is. So paying attention where it was coming from 
and testing my batches and figuring it out like okay how do i get my hands on really clean cacao that's why i got obsessed with it because i always loved it but then i was like well i really like i sourced my everything else why wouldn't i source this <laughs> oh yeah no and then so some of her chocolate has molecular hydrogen in it and some of her chocolate has was it spirulina the green one that i yes, actually thought i wasn't gonna spirulina. like yeah. and mm -hmm. it turned out to be my favorite yeah, which was mostly steric acid, right? Because yeah, yeah, it was how... so creamy. Like it, and and the secret to eating this chocolate is to put it in your mouth and let it let melt. It you don't crunch it. You don't. You just you have to go. You have to go in for the ride. Kind right. Of. You have to go in for the ride, and you have to kind of develop the palate for it too. Because uh, you know, if you have been eating uh, milk and sugary, chocolate, oh yeah, you're not going to yeah. be able to understand it because it got a lot of bitters. And as a society, we're like we're searching out and in, ingesting so many sweet things that mm -hmm. we really don't appreciate bitter as much. Bitter yeah. is such an important taste for us to experience. It's, a, it's so important for our liver. Yeah. Right. So taking bitters, taking bitter uh, um, vegetables and you know grasses and you know things like that, but also in cacao beans or even in coffee, right? If you're really big fanatic of coffee and coffee works for you and you know it doesn't, it loves you back. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, it's important to not just look for uh, clean, mold-free, you know, all those type of things, but also understand when you're adding things to it and you're not tasting the bitter you're not actually getting the full medicine like mm -hmm. that's why i like my coffee black or just espresso so i can taste it as well and i don't drink a lot of it and when, when i do it's mostly for the taste and mostly again from single origin farms with very yeah. unique sustainable practices that's who i like to support plus you have a much better bigger you know flavor profile mm -hmm. as well it becomes an experience so you train yourself over time to eat it darker and darker and darker and darker until you're at a hundred percent and you really yep. can tell the difference between different varieties and where it came from and you know maybe even how it was fermented or roasted or, or under roasted or over roasted all those things kind of come out just like it is with wine tasting you know same with chocolate but the chocolate is definitely food of gods and it just has so many unique capacities uh, one of my friends, uh, Kelly, who is actually in the, my chocolate here, who makes the chocolate. I used to make my chocolate as well years back when I got well uh, physiologically and I was raw. And of course, I haven't been eating chocolate for a long time. David Wolf <laughs> came out with the brilliant <laughs> idea of eating all these cacao beans. So I was like, oh my God, I get a chocolate again, right? That's when obsession started with the cacao beans and chocolate. And it's actually how I built a lot of my business back home and in Canada. Is I started teaching people how to make their own healthy chocolate and about different varieties and different ways and things like that. And it was always fascinating. Chocolate is such a great opener, you know. Oh, hearts, yeah. It's, right. Uh, hearts and minds, right? Well, there's some amazing artisanal chocolate here. The thing is that I haven't found too many that are as generous with the cacao butter as you are. And mm. it's it's in a sense, it's the secret because because 100% dark is very different when it's high in cacao butter than when it's just when it's not because it's it's the cacao butter that allows the flavor to develop um, as you're letting it melt in your mouth. Yeah, I mean, then you can uh, you know you can grind cacao, uh, no cacao vanilla beans on it. It's even more amazing. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. Uh, we've been mostly concentrating on again because I'm mostly low carb, like I don't eat sugars. That's just not my thing. Um, I'm always trying to find ways to optimize chocolate and put other things in there, right? yeah, yeah. You know, like, you know, functional mushrooms, like, like molecular hydrogen or deribose yeah. as a sweetener yeah. and working with different types of sweeteners, like, you know, the monk fruit years back, uh, when we brought the monk fruit on the market and I was doing a lot of chocolate with that, actually the first Lacanto chocolate was made in the same facility that makes my chocolate here. in uh, nice. Um, yeah. By the same chocolates here, it was completely different bar and it was raw. You know, of course, it, it's got changed since then, but um, using different types of sweeteners to bring out different aspects of the cacao, marrying them with different herbs and different, you know, substances like spirulina and, and uh, flavoring. There's just so much you can do with it. And it's such a great delivery mechanism. Again, oh, yeah. You know, you oh, can yeah. deliver Even for medicinals. Chocolate. Even yeah. for medicinals. Okay, so we could talk about chocolate for a long time. Long. We're, yeah. we're gonna sure. we're gonna come up on time, and I, there's a couple of other things that we said we were gonna talk about that I really want to get to because right, okay. Um, we talked about well, I guess I mean 
you focus a lot on the foundation. You focus a lot on the lifestyle, on the meditation, on the grounding, on the getting out into nature, like all of these things for you and for many of us are becoming, if you're not doing that, there's no point almost going to the fancy stuff like the exosomes and the NAD and the peptides. I mean, within, within reason, but, mm-hmm. but where do things like, cause you now with your, you know, and, and, and you guys, you know, like he, Katrina agreed to this interview purely as a mechanism to get information out to people. Um, she's got a full dance card <laughs> to say the least. Um, but, but for people who are educating themselves and I find I'm coming across more and more people where there are practitioners that are, they're jumping to the NAD, they're jumping to the exosome, they're jumping into the fancy stuff. Where do you feel they kind of come in? Like mm-hmm. the things like NAD IVs and peptides and exosomes, like at what point do you think they're, like what, what might be the signs that it's time to weave them into a protocol for someone? And obviously it's going to depend. Context. Yeah. yeah. Context matters a lot. Um, I mean, let's just kind of separate some of these things. We have these nutraceuticals that we're talking about, which is things like NAD, intravenous treatments, you know, like things like ozone, UV via IV as well. We have the exosomes that are um, well, they, you can't inject them anymore. <laughs> the topical use only, unless you go across the border. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's, there's this little nuances about what you can and cannot do with certain things. And then, of course, there's the peptides, which is also a lot of times injectable. Like they come in different forms nowadays. So those are kind yeah. of like the, more like nutraceutical, pharmacological round, right? And then there is also electroceuticals. Right, right, like the PMF and like exactly. the PMF or microcurrent, like all of those kind of devices that can be really helpful. Then there is the light therapy, right, which is frequency based therapies as well. So we're looking at all of them. I think they all have a place in healing. It's just again the uh, the context matters a lot. It just depends on uh, first of all, like I look at everything, uh, including your finances. Like, okay, where is the biggest investment that we can get the most out of? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously getting to the bottom of the lifestyle issues and really turning those around is number one thing for me. Like it doesn't matter. You can have the fanciest biohacking room, you know, but if you don't take care of your, you know, X, Y, Z, whether it's sleep, whether it's relationships, whether it's stress, it doesn't matter. I know tons and tons of CEOs and everybody who's got everything, you know, but they haven't worked on the stress factor or they haven't moved themselves out of the environments that are really creating these uh, conditions that they're experiencing, right? And there's nothing I can do. And yeah. the things that I tell them is not popular. It's like, you need more sleep. You need to take things off of your plate, right? <laughs> They're like, <laughs> I'm paying not- you to fix this. And you're yeah, like, exactly. yes, yeah, and? <laughs> yeah, you know, I always say there's two types of people I work with, you know, people that I prevent the wheels from falling off and people that are really ready to optimize and to like shift their lifestyle. So there's completely two different sides, you know, like different ways and approaches. And you just kind of have to figure out and know where that person is at and work with their personality and their lifestyle demands and their purpose and, you know, make sure that they know what they're doing. So like mm-hmm. number one is awareness. You know, it's like, if you continue X, you're going to get like in this place. Right. So, yeah. and there's so nothing boy, I can do about it. Exactly. There's nothing I can do about it. We can't be blamed for it as a practitioner. You know, a lot of times um, that, that happens a lot. Well, you didn't fix it. Or like, well, you didn't fix the lifestyle, but going yeah. back to this, I mean, lifestyle is a foundation. Everybody likes the cool new stuff and everybody chases it, but nobody wants to do the groundwork and the groundwork yeah. is not sexy. It's not mm-hmm. sexy to wake up at, uh, at, you know, sunrise, you know, and go to dinner at four. No. <laughs> right? Well, it can be sexy to go to dinner at four. I, 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 I don't know. know. I, I would debate that. But it but leaves so is, much more of the night to do other things. Exactly. But society doesn't tell you that. Right? No. Because social pressures and things like that. So I found myself to be super comfortable eating dinner at four and then maybe cooking for somebody else at six and not eating or being at a dinner with other people and just having sparkling wine and if people start pressuring me I was like well I already ate or well, I'm fasting I'm like you know I'm here for the company I want, I want to enjoy you I yeah to be with you and obviously that's you know part of the social interactions you know meals are always there so you have to be comfortable and majority of times if I am going to the environment that I know is going to have things that I don't really want to be ingesting I want to go there with full stomach you know yeah, yeah. you don't want to walk in hungry things. yeah that sure. and also you know I want to have a really restful night of sleep and for that 
to happen, I need to stop eating at a certain time. So I have enough time to fast and, you know, down regulate certain aspects of my physiology. It really doesn't work for me to, you know, sleep with a full stomach. It's just, it does, I don't think it works for anybody. They it just doesn't. don't realize it, honestly. I well, mean, you know, there's, there's some population you know, like that are what we would say wolves, right? That's the chronological, the lion, wolf. I haven't know. met they too many wolves to that little... get into deep sleep though. I, they, they still don't get into deep sleep on a full stomach. Well, uh, I know some. Do you? you know? Yeah, I have seen it, but it's very rare. Like again, it's very rare. I haven't seen and too I, many. And I, and I don't say it's going to be healthy for them anyway. I think eventually it's going to catch up, right? It yeah. just depends on genetics. It depends on you know hormonal factors. You, know, you have more testosterone, you might not even feel some of these things as a male. Mm -hmm. Right until all of a sudden the testosterone is not there, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can't do that anymore. Right? Yeah. So a lot of times we have these hormones that kind of mask things, especially for males. Like they uh, they get away with stuff <laughs> very easily because they can, right? Until they can't. So that's again, it's a it's a, it's a big generalization. So context matters. Lifestyle is the number one thing. You know, like having your sleep, having your routines down. Like I have a detox routine. Like I wake up at four a.m. Why? Because about half an hour to like sometimes an hour of routine that takes me through my whole nymph right so i guasha i skin brush i'm capping you know i'm jumping on my rebounder you know a lot of times naked in front of red light you know <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that just just combining as many things as possible right and you know there is also breath work and things like that and i need quiet time to do that so i rearranged my whole life and that's how i do it and it doesn't mean that it doesn't produce uh, you know points where it might be difficult within a family unit where you have different uh, different schedules and mm -hmm. different different values too. So you know you you can have that like in my family unit is very interesting because we're as opposite as we come. And uh, but you find respect as long as there is respect for each other's need and letting them do their thing, but also you taking responsibility, and not blaming on somebody. Well, you don't let me do this, <laughs> you know. No, exactly. No. I mean, there and that's that the respect means is giving each other the space. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we people people in our line of work we do our best to bring our partners along, and at some level, we have to allow them to come to it when they're ready. You know, we we create the environment as 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 well as we can. And to a point, they'll come along to a point, and then there's a point where they're not ready to go to that next level. Sure. Yeah. And there's a got to be a mutual respect there. But waking up at four o'clock in the morning, like I, it's funny, like I don't see that particularly as being in sync with our circadian rhythm. That's when it works for me. I wake up anywhere between four to five a.m., but I do go to bed fairly early between eight right. and nine, right? So, like, I do get enough sleep during that time. And it's not like I have a uh, clock that wakes You don't me have up. an alarm clock. Yeah. No. yeah. Yeah. I wake up because that's okay. My body had enough sleep. You know, I've gone through the sleep cycle. Um, and I wake up because I also know that I have this amount of time to get some of these things done. And they mm -hmm. are so important to me. My spiritual practice, my breath work, my you know lymph drainage and all the type of things, because again, like I'm really aware of my system and what makes it tick well. Yeah. Right. So prioritizing that no matter what, you know, like and of course, you know, some days you'll slip in and things like this, but majority of days that's what you do. That routine, finding those practices that give you the most bang for the you know like for the buck, basically, whether it's like really taking care of your sleep or really like upregulating your lymphatic drainage and things like this, because for a lot of people, especially chronic cases, right? Um, uh, a lot of people have, um, you know, let's say mold and things like that. You really have to open those detoxification pathways. You really have to get your lymph moving and that's a daily job, right? Yeah. So, so I prioritize that because I know that's a weakness and I, you know, that's something that I need to pay attention to and, and I need to do. And also, obviously exercise, you know, eating within proper amount, light, light hours, you know, mm -hmm. having a diet that's more um, um, consistent with your physiological needs, make up your training, your life demands, your, you know, family demands, all these type of things, taking all of that in consideration, right? Figuring out what it is, what it does look like and not be attached to it. Yeah. And being flexible because that can change, especially as a woman, right? Mm -hmm. things, are changing and things are changing. So I think getting that in the control and really making sure that you're getting time outside, you know, that you're getting skin uh, onto the sun, that you're seeing some of the at least sunset and sunrises. I try to see every sunset and sunrise. That's like one of my goals. 
Well, one. you live in that place, you know, I mean, Katrina yeah. lives in Sedona, which is the place. If you're going to watch sunrises and sets at like a religion, well, you know, this is the place. <laughs> where I travel and when I live in other places, I do the same thing too. Sure. You know? So it's just something that I understand how much circadian biology is linked to the sun. Yeah. And through looking at the sunrise and sunset and those frequencies, you just don't get anywhere else. Yes, we can use the red light and, and panels to help us. But as much as possible to be in sync with the natural rhythm of wherever I am at, including eating natural food and vegetables from that region, you know, Correct. that's why I go into farmers markets, right? So as much as possible doing that. So I, I think that is such a important thing. And even if you do all of that, but you don't correct your stress, you don't mm -hmm. get access to your nervous system, forget about it. You know, again, you can have all the peptides, all the exosomes and NAD, yeah. and I deal with this all the time you don't find access to your nervous system, you don't prioritize that, you're not going to get anywhere. And unfortunately, again, a lot of times, if you have been mold exposed, if you have been radiation exposed, if you have been exposed to some of these factors that really put you in a chronically ill category, working with your limbic system, working with your vagus nerve and your nervous system has to be the number one priority to me. And that's yeah. what I've seen. And that's what I've seen in uh, practice and working with people and just knowing people in the space, you have to address that. It can take different forms and shapes. One of my favorite ways to do it is through programs like DNRS. Um, do you know about the neural um, retraining system? Yeah. Annie Hopper, Healing for Wire. I think that's an excellent program. You have to commit. You need to understand that when you do that, you have to commit to at least an hour a day for at least six months. That's what I've seen. If you commit to it, and it's a lot of soft work, a kind of combination of meditation, visualization, other things that they found, recess, the limbic system, that takes you out of fight or flight and takes you out of that consistent loop that you are in, mm -hmm. that your nervous system is just jacked and just reacting to everything. But you have to commit the time and the energy to it. You don't really have to go to any of their workshops. You can just purchase the program and do it. I think the usefulness of going to their workshops, honestly, is like you can be around people that healed themselves. Yeah, so it's like, the community. Yeah, the community is so important for that. You know, so you don't have to like show up and do that. You, if you do the work, you will get results. There is other similar system. If you just don't vibe with that one, there is the Gupta program. It's a really good one. Uh, it's for a little bit more spiritually like inclined, a little kind of gentler. Uh, there is also neurosculpting. I like that one as well. So they're all kind of the same same systems, right? That you can be using to retrain your nervous system. Um, but again, that's work and it's commitment every day, right? Until you get to a place where you're non-reactive anymore to all these different things that usually will jack you up. There's well, and I other... think there's there's really no way around it, right? Like there's this no is, way around. This is no and so what do you think of things like much, you know, much lighter? Because these are all, I mean, these are heavy hitting programs and they're they work. Like they're amazing. But for the person who's not ready to do that, like what about things like heart math or that's a step brain forward. tap or oh yeah yeah I have, new I calm. Have all of those things those are all great ways to try to work with your nervous system uh again it just depends on like where i think anybody can benefit from a very strong meditation spiritual practice or anything sure. like this but if you are stepping forward using devices and brain tap out of all the equipment on the market that's the one that my majority of my clients really love and they respond really well to i've seen some really good things with that um, you know, again, if you're considering it, you can just get the app first and, you know, listen mm -hmm. to the meditation, see if you're, you know, vibing with the whole thing before getting, getting the whole you know, headset, headset, the headset yeah. just takes you to the whole new, you know, but if you're, let's say you don't have enough money and you just can't afford it, $9 a month. I mean, you can still get a lot of benefit if you just listen to this information. The mm -hmm. heart mass is really inexpensive, very really easy way to, uh, to deal with this type of things. There is another one called Hanu. Hanu Health is just coming out. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that one. I haven't um, seen it yet. Hanu, Hanu Health. Health. Yeah, and they, you can still, it hasn't been released. You know, like I know all the people that are kind of on board with it. I'm really looking forward to actually having them in my hand. But you can pre-purchase it for way less price, you know, than it's coming out pretty soon. There's Mendy, which was a really interesting one as well. I like that one. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Muse, you know, although a lot of people like it. It's just, just you know, yeah, they... yeah. Muse, Muse is interesting. I have a podcast coming out with them shortly. I mean, I used Muse a long time ago, uh -huh. <laughs> like a really long time ago, and when it first came out. And at the time, I think it was the first. It was one of the first 
they were one of the first who really kind of started to gamify meditation a little bit and make it more accessible yes. to people yeah. who me at the time, I was like, I can't meditate. I can't do this. I can't do it. I put on a muse headband. I got, I got right into it. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, it just, it, it allowed me to access Support. meditation in a way that resonated for me. Absolutely. And that's one, some of these devices can help us because girls like, I can't focus. I can't do it. Well, you can put on a headset and then pull along. Yeah. It will still help you. Uh, there is another one that I, I uh, recommend checking out. Again, it hasn't come out yet. It's called Sense. Uh, Sensei. Sense.ai. You know, not not yeah. the Sensei, you know. The, the no, no, this, the headset. Sen Sense. S-E-N-S dot A-I is Sensei. Yeah. It, Sensei. It's just about to come out. I spoke yeah, to them a while ago. Yeah, it's just about to come out. And the reason why I'm so excited about it, I've done a lot of neurofeedback. That's something we didn't touch upon, but I really highly recommend, you know, checking out for anybody, especially if you've got ADD, ADHD, trauma, you know, like any type of um, post- um, post-traumatic post -traumatic. yeah uh, but even if you're just interested in better brain health or better focus and ability and moving through life or if you've had issues with your sleep right mm -hmm. and you just couldn't hack it with anything else a lot of times i'll go like okay I'll, like the nervous system a lot of times could be a brain function so you have to retrain your brain so the uh, this one that's coming out, um, the exciting thing about it, you could train anywhere, anytime. And it looks, the, the people behind it is a really cool team. So I'm looking forward to that where you don't have to go to an office. You don't have to go spend, you know, twenty, forty thousand $40,000, which I have on <laughs> neurofeedback training, you know, advanced neurofeedback training, but you get pretty good consistent results. So I think that one is going to be a really revolutionary way to neurofeedback at home right and uh, at your time uh, on your on your time not not taking you out and pretty cost effectively because your feedback sessions can run you you know anywhere between two thousand to ten thousand dollars just depending on who's doing it yeah right? yeah no so, the sense sense is is definitely so that's not a meditation that's training that's training your brain your feedback right so that's another tool and level so we have the meditation we have the retrain your nervous system by using different techniques like dnrs and gupta and then we have these devices and ability to go to a neurofeedback center. So the, the good things with neurofeedback center is somebody can take uh, uh, your uh, take a map of your brain and mm -hmm. see where the problems are and create a very specific protocols. It's just important to find somebody really good because again, there's a lot of things that are not that great around, but I am super excited about Sensei. I think it's going to be amazing. So about mirroring in the technology and lifestyle, I think we are in a place where we are going to have to rely on technology to get us out of the mess, but we still have to address the foundational things. Yeah. Right. So I using agree. electroceuticals is probably going to become more and more popular. Like there's obviously PMF is nothing new. It's been around for, you know, 40 years or so and more in that, especially in Germany, PMF stands for pulse immigrated frequency devices. I've been doing a lot of research and work in the PMF sector for quite a while. Lots of different machines came through my hands. It's basically a delivery signal um, modality, right? So the, the magnets that are being used within the PMF devices are pulsing signaling to your cells that are communicating to your cells to do a job, right? Yeah. Or to change communication, right? So, or restructure the frequency at which they work, which is, we are mostly light in frequency, <laughs> you know, going down to the bottom level, right? And you have to think of those ways to heal ourselves. So I think they're extremely useful, but ex especially devices that you can have at home. Mm -hmm. Because the problem nowadays with uh, PMF devices, frequency-based devices, and a lot of electroceuticals, I find that the frequencies don't hold in the physiology. So like what I mean 20, 30 years ago uh, or like 50 years ago when the Reif was doing his experiments, uh, Reif technology, there was all these like amazing healing properties uh, that those technologies were producing or even talking to like older generation chiropractors, you know, like they would say a person would be able to hold their adjustment for a month, right? Before something happens. Nowadays, yes. you're in and then next week, everything's you're out back. again and you need to go back, right? And so why so, do you think that is? Uh, why the thing is this, you know, mitochondrial energy, and I think a lot of electromagnetic wave pollution. The MF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's just the combination of devices, you know, that are a combination of different fields that are hitting us. They have not been studied. Mm -hmm. There's not one study ever that's looking at all of these devices that are around us that yeah. are having an effect on our physiology. We don't know. 
right? No, and it's, chaos, and it's chaos, right? It's if chaos. you consider we're electrical beings and we're being bombarded with all this stuff all the time, it's... Yeah, in, in, on top of that, if you are really go even outside of this and you can watch some of other videos, we can't get into this right now that I've done on radiation from the sun, solar system, and like the magnetic field of the earth. So what's happening, that's like a whole other level of electromagnetic shift that our bodies are experiencing right now. So I think we just, our electrical circuits are just not capable of holding the informational, you know, energy and, and frequencies in the, in the bodies for long enough because they get bombarded with things, yeah. right? Yeah. And we're not grounded. We're not drinking proper amounts of water. You know, like we're not structuring water within our cells as well. You probably done interviews with people who talk about structured wars within the cell and easy um, exclusion zone, right? So how that affects, and that has an effect throughout the body and your ability to be able to hold the frequency and not. I think it's one of the reasons some of the people will respond really well to some of the frequency-based treatments and some not, depending mm -hmm. on what's going on in the physiology and how well that crystal inside of their cells, you know, like outside of their cells. Line up. Line well, up. you know, I got, I got my mom and dad a PMF mat. Well, mm -hmm. you know this, last September at the Upgrade Lab show. And I, I often joke, it's the most expensive piece of biohacking equipment I've ever bought. And I bought it for my mom and dad. Right. And I can't get over the difference it's made for them. They and they and my parent, like I've bought them all kinds of stuff. And they, mm -hmm. some things they use for a little while, and then it, you know, they fall off the wayside. But first of all, my mother found out how much I paid for it and was horrified. So, you know, she's like, okay, I do it every morning and every night. But as, as people in their eighties who are still working, I can't get over the shift in their energy just from lying on this mat twice a day for 30 yeah, minutes, twice a day. Majority of times it will improve their circulation, right? There's yeah. a lot of studies between PMF and microcirculation and effect on less emotion, which is the another way blood is moving through the tissue besides your heart pumping yeah so there's a lot of research done around that and you know the uh, pmf sector specifically or bone healing and other things so i think having a low intensity unit of some sort in your house is and in your cool. house but and that's what in i'm saying like, it's in your house because if you have to go somewhere to do this you're not going to do it every day no and it's majority of times you won't hold the treatment as yeah. long. Like I'm also a lot of times not using my mat every day. I might sometimes space, like I know my body, I'll space it out yeah. as well. Yeah, well, you're doing lots of other things too. Yeah, lots of doing yeah. other things, but I think stacking technologies together to really like help go from, because at the end of the day, we want to go from fight or flight to rest and digest. Yeah. Because most the majority of us is just stuck in fight or flight, right? Yeah, pretty and much. a lot of these technologies can help you do that. You know, they can help you get into a like, parasympathetic state. And you can take 20 minute nap on your mat and use a brain tab, you know, or use another technology together and a red light together. You just had like a mitochondrial little mini reset. Yeah. Right. So it's it, like, I, I call them the, my, my special naps. <laughs> you know, when I do that in between. You're super like charged my coffee. Naps. Yeah. My, my coffee. <laughs> yeah. That's my coffee. It was my Nanavi, it was my PMF mat and, you know, it was my brain tap or the red light, whatever I'm using at that point. But, you know, that 20 minutes when you can stack those technologies can be very useful. You know, a lot of times what happens, people buy these technologies, but they don't use them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, oh, you're not using them. So you have to get them into a habit of doing that. So uh, going back to the nutraceuticals, you know, like, like, again, I believe having electroceuticals at home for sure is very useful. And then having uh, practitioners who really have like higher power tools, let's say, the, who understand, let's say, acupuncture system that can help you fix some of the specific problems can be really useful as well. Mm -hmm. So there is some incredible diagnostic technology that's coming from that sector as well. A lot of it from Russia and, and uh, Germany. I'm just about to have a friend of mine come in for our quarterly testing where we do 60 to 80 people sample with all these technologies and then correlating them with blood work and other things to see, okay, well, you know, what is it for? And, you know, like nice all and things like that. But it's always fun to work with them. But uh, the nutraceuticals or the pharmaceutical more gray type of um, like higher priced, something that you have to go a lot of times to a doctor interventions can be extremely useful. Um, I mean, like, do they have to be a part of everybody's life? I mean, it just depends, honestly. I think peptides, you're a big fan of peptides. I'm a big fan of peptides. Bioregulators, they're such incredible functionally. Oh, yeah. Functional units. Again, you have to fix the underlying problem, but they can really help you. They help. The hump. 
They totally can. And they, they help you even to, to, they help the body Sorry. even deal with a lot of the other stuff that you're doing. Like the Absolutely. bioregulators are, are unique in, mm -hmm. in that sense. And frankly, I even find for people who can't get their heads around the bioregulators, even if they use the, um, the, 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 the supplements, the, the yeah, organ, the, the desiccated organ supplements, yeah. like the heart and soil and the yeah, ancestral soil, supplements. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, these guys are sourcing their stuff impeccably, but if we think about where bioregulators come from, that's where they come from. So using those supplements, and this is why I think we see such, and we hear such incredible stories from people mm -hmm. um, using those types of supplements because they're accessing in, in a very small quantity, some of these bioregulators and all of the cofactors that surround them in nature. And mm -hmm. it gives the body a support in a way that is yeah, it, quite unique. It really yeah, propels you. And it, 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 it makes the healing process quicker. Like, can you do it without it? Sure. Yeah. You know, like, uh, but why not try these things, especially because they're, you know, uh, there's so much more um, usage of them nowadays. You know, like when I was using them and telling people about them even 10 years ago, like people had like eyes like this big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doing what? You know, now it's like more normalized. You know, there's, yeah. there's more material on APIM and things like this. Obviously, in Russia, we've been doing it for a long time. So it's not such a, you know, rocket science to us, but here it's like, it's gaining momentum. And again, post COVID, again, we've seen it's been useful with inflammatory processes and things like that. So a lot more people talk about them. Yeah. You know, not just in the anti-aging space, but in the space of recovery and just helping yeah. the body with natural healing processes. Uh, I think those have an immense potential and I've, not just potential, I've seen it. I've seen it work, I've seen I've wor it worked on myself, you know, my family. So it's definitely if you, especially if you're working with somebody who understands or who can educate you about them and how to use them, the right protocols, as you probably know, there was a lot of bad protocols that were barely translated from Russia. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny for a little bit, but you know, it's, it's all changing. And again, it's not like you like damaged your body. If you've taken more of X, you just don't need it. So you just, yeah, it's just, just a little waste of money. Yeah. 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 So the uh, the other aspects to for me um, the NAD therapy. I mean, there's so much talk about NAD. Like years ago, I was not a big fan of intravenous NAD. Again, it just doesn't have as much um, scientific background. There's not a lot of studies on that. But uh, experientially and case wise, you know, you you see how much benefit it can have on a person, and if. If I didn't have a bad run in this COVID, which I did, uh, it was on top of a surgery. And obviously I have a pretty, you know, pretty health history. And you know, um, I've experienced long haul quite a bit, you know, after I've had the run in, like right in the beginning with the um, COVID. And that's actually what got me into intravenous NAD usage, because before that, I've had my really bad experience where I definitely mm -hmm. just right. had PTSD, but it was so early on. At that time, they didn't even have pH right. You yeah, know, like it, it was super painful. I was throwing up all over the place. It was, it was just, I had no business of doing 3000 micrograms, you know, like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> epic. It, it, I, yeah, it's no business of doing this. So, but what I started seeing, um, I started getting some of the clients who would do uh, a very specific protocol, not just spread out NAD infusions here and there. Um, they did a very specific protocol of five day loading of NAD and then would start working with us and my team and all of a sudden you know things go away in half time that i approximately know like when somebody comes in how long it's going to take based on my personality and things like this to get somewhere get some kind of results so here we were getting results literally in half time and i was like wait a second what, what the heck is going on in here yeah and like the only denominator is all of these people came from the same place <laughs> you know they did the same program and now they're getting results much quicker but then just started clicking in place because the mitochondria was working better, you basically filled up your energy bucket and these people were using that energy to heal, they were getting results much quicker. That's amazing. So that's when I started paying attention to the protocol and when I myself gotten into COVID and um, had a pretty bad long haul experience and tried to reverse it with other things, didn't get anywhere. Finally I said, yes, I'll do the NAD, even though it's terrible and I wanna do it. <laughs> You know, that's actually what brought me from not just not feeling unwell, you know, from long haul, but also not remembering when last time my brain was functioning as well. 
So wow. there's definitely a space. I think the protocol matters. The product matters. I know you interviewed uh, Dr. Conover. Who, well, thanks uh, to you, uh, you introduced yeah. us. <laughs> yes, you know, and you know Dr. Neil as well, uh, um, Paulin. And there's other people in the space that are using NAD. I think protocols matter how you do it. You know, uh, the kind of experience you create with, around it, I find matters as well. That's what I've seen in, you know, like in the work that we do, we do it in the retreat format where we combine it with other work, whether it's emotional, physiological, whether it's like stacking technologies together, hiking, good food, things like that. You kind of get a better experience, I think, too, because you can go to deeper healing and mm-hmm. before taking that time off in a way to heal. When there is purpose and an intention, I think you can get better results as well. So when would somebody engage in a therapy like this? I think, you know, when you're over 35, 40, you start dropping those levels naturally. I think it's probably might be a good idea to have a conversation with somebody who is um, using this type of therapy, you know, going to one of your podcasts, like this Dr. Corner, we're listening to that, finding somebody that can do that load up. I think the uh, once what I've seen is when you do this five day protocol, uh, like Dr. Cornwall is doing with um, mitochondria going into fusion, fusion and fusion, you are able to heal much better. It's like, kind of like just filling up your bucket, your energy bucket, and you can do more things with it. And yeah. how often you need to refill that bucket just depends on your rate of pouring it of out. Depletion. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's gonna it's gonna vary from person to person, and it's probably vary person to person for sure. But like whether they athletes, whether they see us, whether they flying around, where they sick, you know, it might take longer to fill up the bucket. Like I almost felt it took me a year of quarterly experiences to get to a place where I'm pretty full. Like I don't need more. Like I don't yeah. come back yeah. from like four weeks of challenge goals. Like where's, where's my NAD? You know, like get me some NAD. It doesn't yeah, happen yeah, yeah. Anymore, You're right? good. So you, you, you stay more consistent. So it could be a very nice thing. Like a lot of times when somebody under 35 or 30, especially in twenties wants to come and do it. I'm like, why? Yeah. You know, you already have natural levels of NAD number one, unless this is somebody who's been through brain trauma. Well, yes, or mold or yeah. mold, mitochondrial issues, things like that. Yeah. That's definitely yes. And you still have to like figure out the right protocol, get them ready for it as well. Because sometimes going into experience like this can be very hard, especially if you're a woman who is not eating enough, who is small framed and has her cortisol and hormones a little bit off. That's the segment that will have really hard time. With yeah. That. So, okay. So we're, we're getting long on time. I know from experience, (laughs) we can talk a long time. Yeah, we can. So so just to close, why don't, why don't we leave people with, um, how do, what's the best way to prepare for NAD? If you're going to do, if you're going to go in for a heavy course of NAD, and then we're going to wrap this up and then we'll just have to have another conversation another day. There's still like seven other things on my piece of paper we were going to talk about. That's right. (laughs) Like I said, it can go anywhere. Uh, So um, how to prepare? I mean, I think it depends on where you're at. Yeah. Like what kind of physiology uh, you have, what kind of issues you have, your age, previous history. So if you're somebody that's been mold exposed. Yeah. um, So someone who's depleted and really needs it. Really needs it. So if there's still some detoxification to do, uh, obviously taking care of that. Um, by transformation pathways, elimination, maybe doing a little three to four months protocol where you using binders and things like we're talking mold specifically, yeah. kind of lower some of these inflammatory drivers and concurrently using peptides, you know, mitochondrial peptides, maybe again, depends on the case, you know, talking to somebody who understands that and can recommend you appropriate peptide protocol would be very useful. During that time, using either sub Q uh, subcutaneous injections, or, uh, again, talking to your doctor, your practitioner, making sure that that's the right situation for you or using suppositories. Mm, so, yeah. Suppositories is great. Yeah. Yeah. Suppositories is great. You know, it's, it's a higher expense because they're expensive, mm-hmm. but it could be like, if somebody is afraid of needles or they can't inject because they get really bad side reactions. If you can't, yeah. sometimes when you get sub Q injections, you get very bad side reactions, that kind of a hard little ball that forms under the I skin. get those from sub Q NAD. Yeah. So there's a few tricks that I can teach you of how to, you know, get rid of those. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically, I don't know if we should be sharing those right now. No, like, not right now. <laughs> yeah. But there's tricks to, to, to that. But also if some people have like really bad reactions, you know, right. Like, and things like that just you know again specific situations um, that can create that 
or the pH is completely wrong for them. So that's where sometimes the, uh, um, the suppositories suppository can be helpful as well. There is specific suppository from Midas Den, you know, like, I don't know if you don't know Dr. John, he's got some incredible information out there and uh, he's got really great suppository collection, right? Where he has, you can use suppositories during your fast, you just check out his website or maybe you get a chance to interview him. It's his yeah, no, I think I'm going to try to get him on the podcast. Yeah, he's, he's super fascinating. He's got lots of good information and those products are awesome. They're really okay. great. Yeah, I've heard um, only good things about them. I've been meeting yeah, each other. They're costly. That's that's the only problem, right? So with NAD, it's all about uh, observability. Oral doesn't work unless you know, like you also have to uh, oral NAD. Oh no, and transdermal. I've already talked about that on the podcast. I get burns from transdermal. Exactly. Transdermal like is really not that bad. great. Using raw materials, you, know, you need to make sure that you have a mitochondria that you know, like or your physiology, you actually be able to make it into NAD. You've talked to the um, Chilo. Right, Nishido people. Nishido, like, yeah, with the yeah, NR, yeah. Yeah, uh, so th those things kind of have to be in consideration. Then there is the IM, sub-Q, uh, intramuscular sub-Q, or intranasal. Intranasal is not my favorite at all. You get a lot of histamine reactions, it burns. Yeah, I've, I've done the intranasal. I actually felt that I felt a bit of a lift from it, but it's very temporary. Could. Like you're not... It's not the same as a therapeutic dose that no, you're going you to get through an IV dose. or um, like you can't snort that stuff all day. It's if you're preparing for NAD drip and you have somebody, you know, that's guiding you and can, you know, get you on a sub-Q and you are in candidate for that, that's an easier way to get your body used to it. Because you see. will experience in sub-Q form, especially if you're really low, you will experience those uh, changes like your chest feels tight, you know, you might feel a little dizzy. There's all these like very in a D type of feelings, which go right. away. Right. You get used to that and you kind of slowly build up a little bit of, you know, a little bit of balance, right, in your body. So it's easier than to go through a higher dose uh, intravenous treatment. And again, if somebody mold exposed or neuroinflamed, a lot of times I will make sure that they have a bunch of, um, well, my practitioners will ensure that they have a bunch of binders on hand mm -hmm. you know, to be mm -hmm. able to bind some of the things that are going to be coming out. Um, you know, just obviously working with people that are aware, you know, like how to deal with these type of situations, eating clean, um, you know, working on yeah. all those aspects. But a lot of times it's the, sub Q and the binders that can help somebody get there or um, also adding things like glutathione and vitamin C, just supporting the detox pathways as well, just to kind of gently get to the place where you can do it. The only time um, I also warn for women who are, let's say, low in progesterone to uh, um, look at your cycle patterns and not doing the luteal phase. It's brutal. The luteal phase. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's it's too hard. You're already low and you're asking your body so much. And especially if you're a small frame, if you're under eating, you're underweight, right? And you have low cortisol, it's just much harder. It's mm -hmm. still a great thing to go through. And but it'll be harsh. It's just harder. It's just harsh yeah. on the body. So really, if, if I see somebody like that, I was like, let's feed you. <laughs> let's build you let's get your hormones a little bit balanced you know you're probably four months away before you were you know can't even do such a thing like i don't want you to be crashed afterwards yeah have a yeah. very bad experience right so that's when you have to be careful with things like that and you know and of course case by case majority of people over 35 40 you know do fairly well yeah um, especially with a good practitioner and good protocols you know they they experience a lift and uh, and a quite quite the experience Right. Report a lot of positive results afterwards. If again, if I didn't do it myself, I wouldn't have believed it. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> all right. So, bottom line: look for a practitioner who's going to talk to you about all these things before they just stick a needle in your arm and dump a bunch of NAD into your system. Um, yeah. Willy and nilly, and I think there's a lot of that around. Mm -hmm. um, so, all right, Katrine. I um I can't believe how long we've gone here. I'm going to get in trouble, but uh, oh. this has been. <laughs> Fantastic conversation. I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, all right, you have one minute. Last parting thoughts or share for the audience before we take off. And then 
you know, if they, I think you're on social media, you're, you're not a big social media person, but you're no, out there. So <laughs> yeah, I am not on social media. You might see some educational material via bio optimizers. We have a cookbook out that I put out, uh, yeah. plant-based because I am still eating majority of time plant-based, even though I eat animal protein Yeah, and love plants and they're colorful and beautiful. And if you don't have a problem with them and they love you back, <laughs> you know, you can get quite a bit out of them. Uh, obviously, Bioptimizers has a lot of resources. Uh, there's um, there's been more information coming out on that subject, especially in women's health. You know, we're doing more educational videos and things like that. I'm a little bit on social media and a lot, just don't have time for it. Yeah. Uh, as far as parting gift goes, you know, parting words. I mean, honestly, I think the most uh, important thing for anybody, like when you're taking care of your health, to really take care of your relationships. Mm -hmm. because being chronically ill especially you know can put a lot of strain on your relationships so finding way in grace wherever you are in that journey you know i wish you well and finding better relationships in your life to support you in your process beautiful thank you so much thank you katrine this was amazing thank you